getting right into the Word today. Get your outlines out. Shows the direction that we're going this morning. First verse we're going to be looking at is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're talking about reaching out and touching someone. And I believe that this should jumpstart your faith today. God is doing great things in the midst of our bodies, in the midst of our life, and in the midst of this church. And so I'm glad that each and every one of you are a part of it this morning. Well, the first verse is found in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6, and it says this. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Well, this morning before you leave service today, I want you to understand one of the greatest truths I believe found in the Bible. It's an awesome thing that God has done to help us in the midst of our Christian life. And it is this, that you and I, all of us together, are a part of the body of Christ. We're all a part of the body of Christ. What does that mean? It means that you and I are Jesus' hands, we're Jesus' feet, we're Jesus' voice. God chooses to use all of us to minister to people all over the place. And we do it in the name of Jesus. So we are the body of Christ. It is God's Spirit that dwells in us, this verse says, and we are to go out and to be Jesus to the world. He has called us. And so this morning, I want to encourage you with the word. And my hope is that you would find your place in the body of Christ. How many of you know every single part of the body is important? You're not convinced of that, are you? How many of you have ever woke up in the middle of the night and, and hit your baby toe with a bedpost? Yeah, see, now you know. And what happened, man? Your whole body hurts. I remember there was a time I used to get uh, cramps in my legs, and I'd get them in my calf, but a few times I got them right here in my thigh. And oh, man, it's like you're paralyzed. You know, it's like you're walking around just trying to press down, and, and uh, my, my wife would, would put a warm compress on it, it's kind of, she would throw it to me, and I put it next to my arm. <laughs> And it would go away. But the point is, every part of the body is important. Are you convinced of that? Amen. Except maybe the appendix. But uh, not all of you are the uh, appendix of the body of Christ. We all have a purpose. One day, maybe we'll find out what, what that is for appendix. But anyway, the point is, we all have our place in the body of Christ, don't we? That means that God has a plan and a purpose for all of us. And I was talking to Scott today, and he said, Brian, first service today, he goes, man, that, that sermon was, it was good. But really, I didn't think, think it was uh, maybe one of my best, because he just was going overboard. And, and he says, no, he says, the potential of this sermon, if everyone would get involved, if everyone would find their place and purpose, he said it would multiply and grow, and we would accomplish Great things for the body of Christ. That's a good word. That'll, that'll actually preach. Good job, Scott. You and I, we're all different. We all come from diverse backgrounds. But there's something about how we are put together in the body of Christ. We have uh, uh, different walks of life, very diverse, but we all have the same spirit. It's a Holy Spirit that dwells in us. And so that is mightily important. Despite our differences, there is one thing that marks us apart as Christians and other people. We talked about it last week, and that is the love of Christ. It is the love of Christ. It is that compassion that we have for others that marks us apart. We talked about that last week, that they will know that we are Christians by our what? By our love. Not by our bumper stickers, not by our t-shirts, but by our love. And so Jesus is a great example of this in ministry and in the church. If you would uh, notice here in Mark, there is a story. How Jesus reached out to a man who had leprosy. Now, back in the Bible days, leprosy was like the, the kiss of death. It was just a terrible, terrible skin disease where it would, it would literally eat you alive. And not only was it, was it uh, 
physically just uh, appalling, but even in a, in a social uh, context, you were, you were set apart, that you couldn't be around anyone else, and so you were ostracized, and, and you had to camp outside. Um, it was a dreaded uh, skin disease and a social disease. It said, actually says this in Leviticus 13. It's not on your outline, but listen to this. The person with such infectious disease must wear torn clothes. Let his hair be unkept. Cover the lower part of his face and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone. He must live outside the camp. So there was no cure for leprosy, and many of the Jews regarded leprosy as a punishment of sin in your life. And so I'm sure, if you think about this man, he probably felt forsaken by God, he probably felt hated by humanity every day of his life, but he heard about Jesus. He heard that Jesus was in town. And as everyone stood clear of a leper, we see that Jesus was different. Jesus went and he reached out and he touched this man who had leprosy. Now look what it says here, Mark 1, 40 through 42. And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Move with compassion. Say compassion with me. Yeah. Say it again. Compassion. Yeah. Jesus stretched out his hand and he touched him. He said to him, I am willing. Be cleansed. And immediately this leprosy left him and he was what? Cleansed. cleansed. Now, this story can apply with a lot of different parallels in our life. One is you and I. Uh, we were all born into sin. We, we all have that sinful nature, if you will. We all have that, that leprosy of, of sin, let's say. And it is Jesus who reaches out to us. It is Jesus who touches us. And by His touch, by Him dying on the cross, shedding His blood for us, it is something that, that when we are touched by Jesus, we are cleansed. And there is something, can you imagine being that man who had leprosy, who Jesus reached out and touched and he was cleansed? How do you think he felt? Probably overwhelmed to be healed from that leprosy. In a spiritual sense, folks, you and I are healed of the leprosy because of the touch of Jesus Christ upon our hearts and our lives. And don't you love the fact that Jesus reaches out to all of us while we were yet sinners, while we were yet unclean, Christ died for us. And he reached out to us. We are touched by his grace and mercy. We are cleansed. And then you and I are called to reach out as Jesus reached out to us. We are called to be the body of Christ and to reach out to others as Christ reached out to us in that same way. It is a great story how Jesus goes out of his way and he touches this leper. Now, despite the common practice of steering clear of lepers, Jesus does the opposite. He reaches out. He reaches out because of his compassion. And he takes a risk and he touches this man that has leprosy. Anytime you and I move out in a risk for the things of God, it is really faith. You and I are called to step out in faith. How many of you know it takes a little bit of risk to help people? It takes a little bit. We have to step out of our comfort zone, if you will. And not just live life for ourselves, but to live life as Christ would live it. Because the Bible says that Jesus came not to be served, but he came to... And let me ask you a question. If Jesus was alive in Visalia today, where do you think he would be? Who's that going to come <laughs> You guys have an ADD, don't you? <laughs> Jesus would be with the very least of these. Jesus would be with those who are hurting. Jesus 
having that heart of compassion would be out helping the poor. He would be out with the prostitutes. He would be with the sick. He would be those who need a touch. Now, folks, you and I are called in the same way to go outside these walls and to minister to those who need them. How many of you know we take risk every day? We take risk every day. Every time we jump into our car, I went and visited with my brother uh, for, for two days this week, and, and he had open heart surgery, and his wife had breast cancer, and I was just hanging out with him for a couple days just to encourage him. And I noticed something that as I was driving a few miles away. How many people text while they're driving? Isn't that amazing? Now, maybe I'm aware of it because my wife said that she heard some of Oprah Winfrey of all the deaths that take place on, on uh, uh, um, uh, with, with texting, all the people who died because of that. Uh, it is amazing. How I many of you know, it just takes a quick second to take our eye off the road and it hits someone. One of my neighbors was on his cell phone, an older gentleman, and, and he, he uh, hit an automobile, killed three kids. It's a tragic, a tragic, just not paying attention, being on the, on the phone. So we take risk. But every time I fly on an airplane, um, I repent of all my sins that I've ever committed. Because there's something about being in an airplane, I think it's probably the most spiritual, because I confess all my sins. Because I think maybe you're aware more of a risk, even though it's probably less of a risk to be in an airplane than driving in a car. I believe they say that. But life is full of risk uh, every day. We take risk all the time, but God is looking for us, for certain people, that we would take risk for God. There's a saying that says, gamblers for gold are many, but the gamblers for God are few. Any of you see the movie Facing the Giants? Raise your hand. See, it was a, it was a great movie, if you get a chance to see it, see it or rent it or whatever. It was put together by a church. And they just wanted to, to share their story. They just wanted to minister to people. And they figured out how they could do it. And so they collected some money and they got uh, 500 volunteers. And they made this movie. And um, uh, they ended up making $10 million. But they're, they're, they weren't even trying to make money. They were just trying to share their faith. And, and it was amazing. And I thought, man, what a great risk. They, they risked a lot. And they spent a lot of time and they, they did that. And it was just something that just seemed like God just blessed it. And I think you and I should always be challenged to get outside of ourselves and help people around us. Having a heart to minister to those who are around us. And so risk becomes faith when we step out. And, and I'm going to narrow that a bit. If you look on your outline, faith is shown in serving when, number one, my love for God and others compel me to be involved. When my love for God and others compel me to be involved. When we get involved, God doesn't see it as risk, but as faith. When the purpose is for love for God and for other people, and we step out in faith to help others. It is something awesome that I believe God joins with us. Look what it says in Matthew 20, 34. Move with compassion. Say compassion. compassion. Jesus touched their eyes and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. If you look, there's many stories where it says Jesus was moved with compassion. In the same way, I think the church as a whole... We can be empathetic to the problems of the world. And you and I are called, I believe, to move with compassion each and every day. It would change your life if every day you would wake up and you would say, Lord, Lord, today would you send somebody my way that I can minister to? It will change your life. God will open up opportunities that you want Believe. I was uh, driving and I happened to stop at, at Bakersfield at El Pollo Loco. If you're in a translation, it's the crazy chicken. Anyway, <laughs> I'm by name. 
Um, and as I was in the parking lot, I noticed this sticker. It was a small sticker. It was about this big on somebody's car. And I noticed it was a sticker uh, from Hawaii. And it was just a symbol, but I, I recognized what the symbol was. And so this couple was getting out of their car. And, and I just felt like I needed to talk to them. And, and so I went to them and I said, are you guys from Hawaii? And they looked at me with a big grin on their face. They said, yeah. And I said, well, I recognized your, your sticker in there. And you, you should have seen the smile on their face. Just that I took time with them. They must have told me during our visit uh, 10 times, thank you for coming up to them and talking to them. And as we were talking, I said, hey, did you guys go to church in Hawaii? And they said, yeah, and we talked about their church, and I was familiar with it. And, and I said, how long have you guys lived here? He said, about a year and a half. And I said, well, where do you guys go to church down? He goes, oh, we haven't found the place. And I said, you know what? I said, there's two churches that I'm really familiar with. In fact, both of these guys know your pastor in Hawaii. And they said, really? And so they were excited to know about these churches. And so I knew what streets they were on. And so I, I told them. And, and they just seemed like I uh, encouraged them so much. He said, hey, hey, come and meet my wife. Come and meet my wife. And, and, and he was just so excited. And it was one of those meetings where, it, you know, when you meet somebody, it's not an accident. I was there to encourage them in their faith. God will do that to you each and every day if you are willing to be used. The key is, are you willing to be used? It doesn't take much talent, but it takes a willingness of your heart. Love for God and others should compel you to be involved. It was the compassion of Jesus that compelled him to touch people, to heal people, to meet needs. In Luke 10, 33 through 37, it says, But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him and he bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his beast and he brought him to an inn and he took care of him. And on the next day, he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper. And he said, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy towards him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. It is a story where there was a man who was beaten up by robbers. And he was left on the side of the road. And the first guy, he, he walks up and he sees that this guy is hurt. So you know what he does? He walks on the other side of the street so he doesn't have to get involved in the situation. Then a religious man, he comes up and he sees the guy and he just keeps on walking. Have you ever done that? You see someone who's in need and you say, man, I just don't have time to invest in this. Because how many of you know there is a risk? Come on. When we help somebody, there is a risk that we're we're taking when we help someone. Sometimes people will abuse it. Sometimes people will take your generosity and, and they may hurt you. But nonetheless, we are called to move out with that love and that compassion as Jesus did. And he says, who is the one who helped? And he said, the one who showed mercy towards him. Folks, let me say this. If you don't know this, there are people hurting all around us. And you know what? Even a word of encouragement goes a long ways. I love our church hard love. Our church is filled with people who have a heart of compassion. I love one of the greatest ministries we have in our, our church, and we have a lot of them. One is adoptive love. That just love our adoptive block. And if you're a part of adoptive block, raise your hand. If you're in the service, I hope you're coming for service. Okay. Adoptive block is, is a great ministry. We've adopted a block. Um, if you go up to Larry, Santa Fe, there's a bunch of apartments, and we just um, have adopted that neighborhood. 
And it is amazing to see people's response as you go there. Folks, if I were to stand on a, a street corner preaching about repenting and preaching about the Lord, people would probably walk by. But there is something that we can learn what Jesus did. He moved with compassion and he helped meet the needs of people. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. It is true. And the very first time we went out there, and I, I, I've only been out there a few times, but the first time I went out there, we were passing out hot dogs. <laughs> People go, what are you doing? We go, we're just passing out hot dogs. We're just showing God's love one hot dog at a time. You want ketchup or mustard? <laughs> and People laughed, we all laughed, and we've been in that neighborhood ever since. And I don't know how long it's been, I think maybe two years. And we've done some, some of the, the simplest stuff. How many of you get a, a little bit uh, nervous when you have to share your faith to somebody? Be honest with me. Don't lie. We're in church. I'm a pastor. Don't lie to me. <laughs> okay, if you didn't raise your hand and meet with me, we're going to be witnessing after. <laughs> But how we started out is we went and the, some of the guys put those little peepholes in some of the, the doors because the lady said they had some safety concerns and so they, they put those little peepholes in the doors. There's people that needed a refrigerator. We had an extra one in church and we gave them our refrigerator. Some we need a washer and dryer and, and we had a washer and dryer in our kitchen. We weren't using it much and so we gave the washer and dryer to the family that needed it. I was in one house and... and uh, I saw that they didn't have any beds in the house. And so the church, we went out and we got beds for the family who had no beds. Can you imagine how, how much we take for granted? Folks, you would have thought it was Christmas Day. People just excited to get that. And you know what? We could walk in that neighborhood and you could say something about Jesus and believe me, people will listen. Do you know why? Because they've been shown the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. Talk is cheap, isn't it? But there's something about showing that compassion, reaching out to people who need help. And so we see that, that love for God and our love for others should challenge all of us. It should compel all of us to move outside and to help others. And then write this down. The greater the compassion, the lesser the sacrifice. Now, I love this because the people who go out to adopt the block, do you know that they go out every single Saturday? We have not missed, in two years, we have not missed one time of going out in that neighborhood. To my knowledge, not one time have we missed. And that's a huge commitment, isn't it? And I'll talk to people, there's one guy, Gordon, I say, Gordon, I said, man, thank you for being so faithful and going out there. You know what he says to me? Oh, no, Pastor, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having this, and we can go out and minister to people. Because uh, he says, every time I come back, I, I don't know what it is, but I get so happy <laughs> ministering to people. Uh, uh, Cynthia, I talked to her one time, long time ago, and I was talking to Cynthia, and she goes, you know, it's the highlight of my week to go out there. I think it was you, Cynthia. If not, it was probably George. <laughs> You know, when you help people, there is such a joy that there's the, the sacrifice is lessened. Does that make sense to you? The greater the compassion you have, the lesser the sacrifice. Matthew 9, 13 says, but go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. I love the fact that, um, you see, when there's a great big disaster like Haiti, you see how many people... Stop what they're doing and they help Haiti what was taking place. I like that, but you know what I don't like about that? We should be doing that all the time. Because there's hurting people all over the place. You don't have to go far. I, we used to go to Mexico and we used to take blankets and jackets and shoes and 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 we, we still have trip land on there, but we used to to the orphanages we, we would take uh, Backpacks, And I, I told the church we were going to go down there and we are going to take all the school supplies to the orphanage. And I tell you, our, our, um, we had so much stuff. Boxes piled high of everyone who had a, a heart for this little orphanage that would, that would help and we would support that orphanage. 
But you know what? We don't have to go to Mexico. We don't have to go very far. We, we can go three blocks this way or three blocks that way. I mean, there's people hurting all over the place. Thank you. We need to step out and the help. And then number two, when I realize that serving is God's design for growth. It is God's design for growth. Where are the greatest leaders found? They are found among the servants. Look what it says in Luke 22. But it is not this way with you, but the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest and the leader like the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Again, Jesus says, I did not come to be served. The creator of all things who wrapped himself in flesh to be with us, Jesus, said, I did not come to be served, but I came to serve. And so you and I should be the same way because there is a temptation to use all of our resources, all of our abilities to use them on ourselves. That was a temptation that Satan tried to do to Jesus. Jesus, you have all this. Jesus, throw yourself off the temple. The angels will, will catch you. See, in all those temptations, Satan was trying to get Jesus to use his resources for himself. That was what that was all about. And nothing's changed. Because the enemy of our soul wants us to use everything that we have for ourselves. Because a lot of times it's hard to let go, isn't it? Come on. Am I preaching the right, church? It's sometimes hard to let go. But there is a greatest joy when we can open our hands. Because the root word of being miserable is miser. When we hold on to things. You heard me tell the story how they used to catch monkeys in South America. They, they, they would, the monkeys would steal the fruit off the trees. And it would drive the farmers nuts and it would take their profit. So they would get like a coconut shell. They would tie a hole in it and put like a strong uh, rope or twine in the coconut shell. And they would make the hole just big enough for those greedy little monkeys to stick their hand in it. To grab the fruit, and then you know what they do? They would close their fist, and they couldn't get out. All they had to do was what? Let go. But those greedy little monkeys would not let go. They would hold on, and it would cost them their lives. And the farmers would come and cock them on the head. Oh. <laughs> but it makes for a great story, doesn't it? Well, there's no PETA people here. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, <laughs> each person in this room, I believe, we have an abundance and an overabundance. And I believe the more that we give, God gives back to us. In the same way as we give to a dot the block, it just comes back to us. And we have no intention of getting anything back. Our objective was just to give with no strings attached without getting anything in return. And what a blessing it has been in our, in our church. And where I go at different places, people say, oh, you pass our heart of the valley, man. What a, what a good church. I hear this and I hear that. And so people who, who serve adopt a block, well, I tell you, you, you give them. You guys are doing a phenomenal job. Can we tell them thank you? It is God's design for growth. Jesus does his best work, I believe, among those who serve. The greatest mentoring is done when people serve. Remember the story of Joseph? Joseph was there. God told him that he was going to be um, uh, in a position to where his family was going to bow down to him. And it was amazing to see how God trained Joseph for leadership. He trained him as he was a servant, as he was in Potiphar's household, and he became a servant. And he didn't go to Princeton, but he got thrown into prison. 
And even where he was in prison, he was raised up to a level because Joseph learned to serve. Wherever he was planted, he wanted to bring glory to God. Even though he was away from home, even though he could have complained, got bitter, he chose to flourish where God planted him. And in Ephesians 2.10 it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for, say it with me, good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Say walk in them. God has prepared us. I believe God wants to raise up an army of people who are willing to get out of themselves and to serve. To be the hands, to be the feet, to be the voice of Jesus. There's no shortage of people who need help. There are shortage of people who are willing to serve. The Bible says that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Can you imagine? If you had a farm and you had all this fruit and you had acres and acres of fruit trees... And they were getting ripe, but there was no one to pick the fruit. What a waste. What a waste. You and I are called to get involved, and it helps in our growth as well. I, I love to see how people have, have grown people in this church. And I'm, I'm going to, uh, I always ask her if I can tell this story, but uh, I always pick on my good friend Debbie. And uh, I, I, I love Debbie. Debbie is the leader of our ladies' ministry. And about 14 years ago, almost 15 years ago, when I first met, met Debbie, I met Debbie at uh, Kuia Lake for the very first time. And Debbie had a Bud Light in one hand, and she had a cigarette in another hand. And I'm thinking, she would be a great woman's ministry person. <laughs> a true story. I can't make this stuff up. This is better than fiction. And to see Debbie start coming to church faithfully, and I can remember she said this, and I, and I, don't, I don't remember the sermon, but she said a long time ago, she said, Pastor Brian, when you talked about serving in church, it changed my life. Now, Debbie started cleaning the toilets and cleaning that church, and we had a 15, um, 1,500 square foot building. And she would clean it faithfully. And it was great. Before I used to clean it. I hit my cleaning, I cleaned it, and it was not a big deal. Then we moved to another a church over on Jacob Street in the north part of town and had this church, and it was probably double that size, almost 3,000 square feet. It was big stuff, our first church that we had. And Debbie would be there cleaning it and all that good stuff. And, and, and I can also remember uh, uh, it was built in 1941, so we wanted to paint the church. And there was me and three ladies during the week, and we were sanding the church with no sanders, but with sandpaper. And this guy drives by, and and he's looking at me, and he's he's smoking a cigarette too, and he's out there. He goes, "Hey," he goes, "What are you guys painting this church with?" And I I showed him this this sprayer. It was, we got it at a garage sale for like five bucks, and and it was one of those cheap ones. First one. I made. He goes, "Oh," he goes, "I can't let you do that." He goes. He goes, I saw you guys out here standing. He says, would you mind, could, would you let me paint your whole church for you for free? Let me think, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's something when we step out and serve, God shows up and miracles happen. And as Debbie would just continue to serve, you would see growth take place in her life and how she would be, feeling, be filled with, with God's stuff. And she's probably the most spiritual person in our church. <laughs> and then to see that we moved from that 3,000 square foot place to 8,500 8, over here off of Tulare Avenue, Debbie's still cleaning the church. Sometimes by herself. 8,500 square feet. And then you know what? We moved here. We have about 22,000 square feet here. And you know, there's been sometimes that 22,000 square feet, not 2,200, 22,000. Sometimes I've seen Debbie clean this whole church by herself. Without complaining. <laughs> but that's equal to about 15 to 18 homes. And she would come and clean by herself. It should not be, right? We should have 25 people be here on Thursdays to clean the church. But the point is, as she has... 
and stepped out and said, God has so grown her in so many ways. And I've seen it firsthand, almost unbelievable. But I believe it started with stepping out and just serving by cleaning toilets. And God has raised her up. There's something that happens, folks, when we so humble ourselves. And then the last point this morning. Faith is shown in serving when I understand that my location is not important, but my involvement is. I can remember my youth pastor when I was growing up, and I was probably about 17 at this time, and he said, Brian, because you are willing, God is going to use you. And I said, what? He goes, you know, you're willing to help wherever you're at. God's going to do great things in you because you're willing. Folks, it's not talent. It's being willing to serve the Lord. Now listen, it's not your location that's important, but it's your involvement. Again, let's read about Joseph in Genesis 39, 21. But the Lord was with Joseph, and he extended kindness to him, and he gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge, because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made him prosper. I believe that when we serve, when we get outside ourselves and we serve other people with getting nothing in return, there's something with God's grace that he multiplies and he blesses you in so many ways. Because we are showing God's grace. See, it doesn't matter where Joseph was because he was in, he was a servant. But yet he served. He was in prison. But yet he served. It wasn't his location, folks. It was his involvement. Wherever he was, he was going to serve for the glory of God. And God so raised him up and grew him up as he served that he became second in command of all of Egypt. And he saved a whole nation. And God used service to grow him up. In John 17, 4, it says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work which you gave me to do. But we are called to be faithful with the little things. Each and every one of us, we have a purpose and a plan for our lives. You are all the body of Christ. There's probably about 600 people who call who call part of the Valley Durham. And as we grow and continue to grow, usually in churches only, as the rule says, 20% of the people who do 80% of the work. It should be 80% of us. It should be all of us that we find our plan and purpose in our lives. Today, I'm talking to make a plug at 2 o'clock for a meeting talking about your shape. What has God gifted you in that you might get involved? But the key is make yourself available to God. Even pray. We're going to pray in a little while. But say, Lord, use me. Lord, here am I. If you need help, Lord, I make myself available to you. And watch God work in miraculous ways in your life. Someone said that serving is all about seeing lives transformed. Isn't that true? Yes. Serving is all about seeing lives transformed. There is no greater blessing than seeing that happen before your very eyes. To see God's faithfulness. And I know as a pastor, one of the greatest things that I get to see is I get to see people transformed. And if we take this, as Scott said, if we take this and embed it in our hearts, watch how God does great things. I just want to take time for all of you who serve our worship team. Don't we have a great worship team? I was blessed by worship today. I, I always get blessed. We don't pay anybody to do our gardening. And, and I, tell you, I get tickled every time I see it. They have a lawnmower about this big. And, and if you look when you leave how big this grass is and all that, it's big. If you don't think so, come help mow one of these days. And they do it. They pick weeds. And, and I get joy. They just do it for the joy of the Lord. I say, thank you. And they, oh, man, this is great. 
and just have so much joy in doing. Those who make the sandwiches on Sunday, I think now we do it on Thursdays, make sandwiches and we take them um, um, to our Doppel Block area and we just hand out free sandwiches. Bless you guys for being faithful to that. Thank you, you've done the coat ministry who gives coats to people and shoes and all those ministries. Bless you and uh, good stuff. People's life can be changed by just the little stuff that we do. I hope we get that today. Because <laughs> if you can grab a hold of that and do the little things, we're going to see great big things happen in this place and in our community. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can be a part of your kingdom. And Lord, as we are here today, Lord, I pray that your word would so be planted in our hearts that we would step outside of ourselves and we would help others. That, Lord, that truly the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Lord, help us that we can be effective for your kingdom. Lord, help us here in Heart of the Valley that we can truly have your heart of love and compassion that would compel us to get outside of our pews and to help people in need. Lord, help us that we would show your grace and your mercy and your love and compassion to those who need it. Lord, we are here today and we say, Lord, use us that we might change our community. Lord, that we might touch lives to see that they might be changed to be like you. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. How many of you guys spoke to you in this message today? That's perfect. All right. <laughs>